Hey guys. This is part 7 of what if Naruto and Sasuke became friends a few years early. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. Chapter 20 Hinata wasn't losing per se, but she wasn't exactly winning either. That much, at least, Naruto could tell for sure. As the girl dealt with Misumi's stretching limbs with her gentle fist technique, he couldn't help mimicking the motions himself, as if he were the one fighting in the arena thinking about and questioning each blow that Hinata went for. Ah, uh, no! He exclaimed after a particularly brutal one-two punch to the girl's chest, which sent her flying back a few feet. You gotta duck under that, not into it. Gah! Naruto's heart nearly skipped a beat as the girl parried a kanai that was aiming for her chest, managing to land a good palm strike onto her opponent's chest in answer. That was a close one. Nice, Hinata! He screamed out leaning back and using both of his hands to form a megaphone as he shouted excitedly. As it turned out, however, he'd been using those very same hands to keep his balance against the railing, and he found himself screaming once again as he fell backwards, tripping onto the cold stone balcony that he and the rest of his team, San Sakura, stood upon. That looked like it hurt. Sasuke teased, smirking down at him. What are you smiling about? Naruto whined angrily from the floor sitting up and rubbing the back of his head as he turned back towards the battle at hand, watching attentively as Hinata barely staved off her opponent. You, actually? Yeah, haha. Naruto deadpanned, not even bothering to look at his friend as he spoke. I fell, how funny. Not that. Sasuke wore an amused expression, but also one that carried with it a small sense of pride. It's just cool to see how much you care about your friends. If Naruto had been drinking anything, he was fairly sure he would have spat it out across the boy's face in comedic fashion. W what? Naruto sputtered as a small blush came to his cheeks. First, during Sakura's fight, you were cheering so loud after she won that Sabuza smacked you, and now, when Hinata's fighting, you're getting into it. Dodging and weaving like you're the one fighting. Sasuke's smirk became teasing once again. I just think you look funny. He glared at his friend for a moment before deciding to not respond, leaning once more against the railing looking down on the arena below them as he checked in on Hanada's fight. Once again, it was going SOSO. She's mediocre. Sasuke spoke honestly as he took the spot to his right on the railing. Not bad, just... Well, she's certainly not as strong as that Niji kid. He made the gentle fist look unbeatable. She's making it look... Okay. Naruto didn't particularly want to agree with his friend's statement, but it was hard to argue looking at the girl's form. Like he'd said, it wasn't like it was incredibly poor, or really even all that bad. But it was stiff, and it was clumsy, very far from the free-flowing style that her relative had demonstrated. Niji had gone from strike to strike, blow to blow, never once giving any time to respond, every movement given purpose. Hinata, in contrast, seemed to have to think about every motion, hesitating after nearly every hit, leading her to take far more hits than Niji had, even though he had faced down a far superior opponent in Lee. It seemed, however, that Masumi's lack of skill would be his own downfall. Even though she was far less skilled than her cousin, she was still clearly superior to her opponent in the arena. Naruto shouted out his support as the Hyuga landed a particularly devastating blow her palm connecting directly with the man's chest, atop his heart. Even with a cloth over his mouth, the blood that Misumi coughed up was evident as a red stain. You've got this, Hinata! Naruto called out, leaning forward over the railing. He's almost down, finish him off. He watched a bit curiously as the girl's cheeks became a dark scarlet, and she fidgeted for just a moment as she brought her hands up before her stepping into her opponent's guard one final time as she delivered the final strike, sending Misumi and his bendy limbs to the floor. Yeah! Naruto pumped his fist, jumping up and down excitedly, and nearly managing to plummet off of the balcony he was stood upon, only staying up thanks to Sasuke grabbing his collar, hauling him back up as he berated him for being an idiot. 
Still, it didn't really hamper Naruto's mood at all. So far, Team 7 was 2-0, and with most of the insane people were out of the competition, there was a large likelihood that Sasuke would be joining the three of them in the next round. Ah, uh, I probably shouldn't have thought that. Naruto realized, mentally berating himself. Now Sasuke's gonna lose. In the first place, you need to be more careful, and, Naruto are you even listening to me? He looked up at his friend, who appeared to still be monologuing to him about the dangers of jumping near or around large falls. I'm sorry, Sasuke. He put his hands on the boy's shoulders, pretending to cry. I've cursed you. Now you're going to get matched against some super powerful ninja, all because I had to open my big fat mouth. The hell are you talking about? The boy pushed him away, a look of annoyed disgust on his face that Naruto knew he was faking. You didn't say anything. But I thought it, Sasuke. He sobbed audibly, perhaps hamming it up just a bit too much. I thought it. The boy sighed as he flicked him in the forehead, muttering under his breath about how he'd gotten stuck with Naruto of all people for a friend. Naruto himself merely laughed, poking and prodding at the boy as Hinata was proclaimed the victor of her match, beginning to walk nervously back towards her team, a small smile set upon her face all the while. By the time she made it back up the stairs, to the sounds of her teammates cheering, and Naruto's own, her cheeks looked like they could have powered the entire village. You did very well out there, Hinata. Her mentor Karinai smiled as she reached down and gently ruffled the girl's sweat-matted hair. You handled his aggression with poise and countered incredibly. T thank you? The girl mumbled, rocking from side to side as she took their praise, seeming both bashful and hungry to receive more of it. Yeah. Her other teammate, Kiba, shouted out, the dog on his head hanging on for dear life as he hopped up and down in excitement. You really outdid yourself out there. That was awesome. Indeed. Shino, her final teammate, spoke out quietly leaning against the back wall in an extremely edgy fashion. It's because you use your opponent's greatest asset, his stretching limbs, as your method of attacking him, it's obvious to me that. Oh, Kiba interrupted, stepping in front of the bug user. Once all of us win our rounds too, we should all go out for some meat later. Ouch, Sasuke murmured. Yeah, Naruto agreed, silently wishing the man well. Imagine cursing yourself that hard. Not even I was that bad. As the conversation died down, the roulette once again began to turn, causing everyone in the room who had yet to fight to turn towards it, anticipation eating away at them all as they awaited their moment. When it finally stopped, a confident snarl came forth from their resident beast master. Hey, took him long enough. Kiba Inazuka versus Kankuro. I hate you. Yeah, I would too if I sucked that bad. Sakura growled from her crater in the floor of their makeshift arena, trying and failing to rise a final time to face this snake bitch once more in combat. Ah, uh, what's the matter, out of steam? I'm going to kill you. Her teacher for all of an hour walked to stand beside her, gazing down at Sakura with a shit-eating grin that could have rivaled one of Naruto's. You're honestly welcome to try. I don't know about you, but I've been having a pretty good time. The woman had the nerve to yawn stifling the noise into her hand as she looked around the arena. Still, I thought your curse mark would have activated by now. Anko stared down at her, eyes narrowing. You're not secretly holding back, are you? Sakura glared at the woman with murder in her eyes. Does it seem like I'm holding back? I mean, honestly? Kinda, you certainly didn't impress me very much. Sakura tried with every fiber of her being to stand, gritting her teeth with rage coursing through her and felt a small prick on the back of her neck, like a needle. A second later, she felt almost entirely revitalized, only the lingering dregs of her exhaustion still hanging on her. Ah, there we go. Enko spoke, sighing with exhaustion. I was wondering how long I'd have to berate you for before your curse mark flared up. Sakura barely heard the woman. Anger and rage coursed through her as she drew a kunai from her bag, spinning it on the tip of her finger and bringing it into a reverse grip. She charged at her mentor a second later, bringing the weapon up from a crouching stance. The strike was batted aside with the back of Anko's hand, diverting the blade just to the left of her, 
impacting into her trench coat and cutting a deep hole as she jumped away. TSK. Anko sounded annoyed, dodging two more of Sakura's blows as she fell back. I really like this coat, you know. In an instant, Sakura found herself blown back, landing a few feet away as she skidded to a stop. As her head impacted against the stone floor below her, she felt the anger that had been clouding her mind abruptly vanish, replaced only with pain. Ow. She let out. Ah, uh, come on, really? Her teacher crouched down next to her, looking exhausted. Are you seriously done already? W, what are you talking about? Her head felt cloudy, and she couldn't really remember the last thirty seconds all that well. She realized what must have happened a second later. Oh, did I? Did the curse mark activate? Anko sighed, but nodded, sitting on the floor beside her and offering Sakura a hand, nonchalantly lifting her off the ground without even straining. Well, for all of five seconds, yeah, but then just as soon as you had it, it was gone again. I guess, that must just be how it works. Sakura couldn't help but feel a small bit of relief, along with a twinge of disappointment. Her curse mark wouldn't be controlling her easily, not like it did in the forest of death. She was safe. That's what I want, right? No. She looked up, a bit shocked, to see her mentor removing her trench coat and throwing it off to the side. She also couldn't help but look at the woman's figure, which was now on almost complete display before her, and silently curse her for her biological luck. It was only a second later that she questioned why Anko would do such a thing in the first place. Um, Anko-sensei, what are you doing? The woman looked up at her, seeming a bit confused, before her visage cracked, and she giggled. Right, sorry, this probably seems weird. The woman turned around, lifted her hair to show the back of her neck, and a second later, a black mark pulsed into being. That's... Anko let her hair fall back down and turned back to look at Sakura with a sad smile. Yeah, we're a lot alike you and I. Her mentor sighed, running a hand through her hair as she seemed to try and think. Which is why I know that your curse mark shouldn't have gone away so quickly. Wait, what? Sakura couldn't help but be confused. She'd had no idea that curse mark even existed a few days ago, and now here she was, being lectured about what it was supposed to be like. A curse mark, from my experience, acts as an embodiment of negative emotions inside of someone. Anko rubbed the back of her neck, though from what Sakura could see as she sat down across from the woman, a foot or so apart, she hadn't truly meant to. Whenever I want to use it, which isn't very often, mind you, I think about stuff like, the people I've failed, and the comrades I've lost. It appears pretty easily like that. The jonin murmured under her breath. Sakura felt a faint sadness lingering in her mentor's words but refrained from asking about it. She decided that some things were better left unsaid. So, what do you think's wrong with my curse mark? Oh, right, she seemed to snap out of her thoughts, looking back down at Sakura. Don't get me wrong, nothing's bad about it. Anko put her hands up as if surrendering, faking a smile as she continued on. If anything, I'd say it's far better for you, since it's not just going to be popping up willy-nilly. If I were to guess what's hindering it, though, I'd say that you just don't have an inner darkness. Huh. Sakura hated how she sounded like a broken record, constantly asking questions without anything to say for herself, but she needed to know about what the curse mark was, and how she could control it. After all, if I can harness its power, maybe I can catch up to those two. Okay, so super simple? You've lived a super easy life. Anko gave her an apologetic look. If I'm right, I'd say that you've got a mom and dad who are still together, and you've lived with them your whole life. You went to school on time every day, you made a couple good friendships, and the biggest problem you've ever encountered is schoolyard bullying. That was... pretty spot on, actually. How'd you get all that just from my curse mark not activating? Anko had the nerve to laugh. Cause that's pretty much the only way a kid grows up without much conflict to speak of. Anko shrugged, stood, and offered her hand out to Sakura. Come on, train while we talk. Sakura thought that that sounded terrible, given that her legs still felt like jelly, and she was now nursing a killer headache. But the way the woman had said it made it seem less like a question and more like a command, 
so she took the outstretched hand before her and let her new mentor pull her to her feet. Sakura brought her kunai in front of her, fully expecting it to be knocked from her hand within moments, but determined to still try and win. As she shot forward, Anko began to speak once more. So that begs the question, the woman spoke as she ducked underneath Sakura's strike, smacking her in the stomach with her palm and circling around her, even as she laid on the ground, only vaguely responsive. Why did your curse mark go out of control in the forest of death? She'd been thinking about that too, and she'd come up with what she thought was a pretty good theory. Those guys from the Sound Village. Sakura let out as she got up and dusted herself off, trying and failing to take a stance once more. They were trying to hurt Sasuke and Naruto, and they were using me to do it. I just felt. I felt so. Useless? Her expression must have gave her away because the woman across from her had only a sad smile for her. As Anko's words shot through her, she felt the last of her strength fade. Yeah. Sakura muttered, falling to the ground, feeling completely spent. I felt like. I was holding them back. They could have beaten those guys, if not for me. That was all I could think as that. That girl held me by my hair and dragged me along. She just bashed me over the head. I was barely even conscious. But I could hear them, could hear them flaunt their victory, could hear Naruto and Sasuke stop struggling and, and something inside me just snapped at that. I thought I'm not going to be the reason that they die. I refuse to be. Anko sat down in front of her, paying rapt attention to her. And that's when... Yeah, that's the last thing I can remember clearly before Sasuke stopped me. Sakura shivered, not because of the cold stone beneath her, but because of her own guilt. B but it's not like those memories aren't there, it's like. I felt like I didn't have full control, but when I think back I realize. Anko nodded solemnly, taking her student's hand in her own and holding on to it, whether as some small show of solidarity, or just to let Sakura feel someone else's touch, she couldn't tell. She appreciated the gesture either way. Your actions were your own, right? A small droplet impacted Sakura's leg, and then another but she refused to give in to her tears. She ran her right arm across her eyes and kept speaking. I did it. I know the curse mark may have been influencing me, but I know that I was the one that made the decision to stab her in the stomach, and I was the one who decided to stab her in the shoulder, and, and I know I was the one who was about to bring that kunai down and end her life. The moment she finished screaming her heart out, the dam inside her seemed to burst, and she could no longer hold back the tears that flowed down her face like streams. The strain of fighting to survive for the last few weeks, the thoughts Naruto and Sasuke's injuries, and her own guilt seemed to crash into her like a tsunami. She was allowed to cry alone for only a few seconds before her eyes shot open in shock, realizing that Anko had brought her into a tight hug. W what? Her new mentor didn't so much as speak, but the contact, the touch alone, was enough to force the sobs to flow out of her, and she let her head rest in the crook of the woman's neck as the minutes ticked by, the both of them silent. She's a bit of an odd teacher. Sakura thought as her cheeks began to dry. But I guess she's not so bad. The winner is Kankuro. Naruto couldn't help but let out a disappointed sigh as the defeated Kiba lay motionless in the arena below them. The match hadn't even been close, despite the Beast Master's initial confidence. Kiba. Hinata's quiet voice echoed from beside him. She'd watched the match along with the rest of her team, and it seemed they were having very similar thoughts. It was a decent performance. Sasuke spoke up. It's a shame his opponent outclassed him. I think he could have put up a real fight against a lot of the others here. Hinata mumbled something under her breath that Naruto couldn't quite catch, but he thought it sounded vaguely like someone like me. Shino proceeded to speak about the effort Kiba had put into his training, of lack thereof, but Naruto tuned him out, instead looking at Hinata with a questioning gaze. He picked up on it before, but the girl seemed to have some sort of inferiority complex. She honestly believed she was an inferior fighter to Kiba, Shino, and probably the rest of the genin in this room. But she's not even all that weak. Where do those feelings come from? All of a sudden, the words Sasuke had spoken, about her being the disinherited after her sister defeated her, came back to him. 
Naruto couldn't help but feel a twinge of pity for the girl as she and her team watched Kiba be taken away on a stretcher. He was wounded, but not overly so. He'd make a full recovery within a few days. Still, that meant that it was almost time for the next match. And that meant that hopefully, he'd have a second to talk to Hinata about what she was going through. He and the rest of the genin turned towards the screen, and Naruto silently hoped it would be a fight he didn't care too much about. When the screen came to a stop, he audibly sighed. It looked like that idea was out the window. Sasuke Uchiha vs. Kabuto Yakushi Finally, Sasuke spoke simply, turning towards Naruto and nodding once, before stepping towards the stairs and beginning the journey to the arena below. Good luck. Naruto called out to him, giving him a thumbs up and his best sunny smile. The boy returned it with one of his own, far more sedated than his had been but one that meant the world to the both of them. Don't worry, I'll win. Who said I was worried? Of course you'll win. Oh, come on. Now you're actively trying to jinx me. After all, Sasuke Uchiha is the strongest genin. Stop. Wielder of the Sharingan. Naruto. As Sasuke stood in front of the boy named Kabuto, he couldn't help but feel uneasy. Whenever he locked eyes with the boy in front of him, it felt a lot like when Orochimaru had gazed into him, analyzing every part of him, but not even truly registering his existence. It was to a lesser degree with his opponent now, but it was enough to make him recall the pain in his chest as he walked. Going to have to watch my ribs here, Sasuke planned silently. I don't know if I'll be able to get up if I take a serious hit there. Orochimaru had struck him but a single time and the force of the blow alone had shattered two or three of the ribs on his left side. And he tried to place the curse mark on me. Sasuke couldn't help but think about that. What if the curse mark had landed on him instead of Sakura? Just what would have come about? Would he have even been able to compete? Good luck, Sasuke. Get M. The voices of both Ino and Naruto caused him to shake his head, dismissing his pointless thoughts. Sakura had received the curse mark, not him, there was no use dwelling on what could have been. The proctor ran through the rules, though it was obvious by now that everyone had listened in on them during Sakura's first fight, taken them in, and then tuned the man out after that. Neither he nor Kabuto seemed to be even remotely paying attention. Are the both of you ready? Yes, he responded simply. I am. Kabuto spoke, smiling over at Sasuke in an overly happy way and it was enough to send a small chill down Sasuke's spine. What is it with this guy? Then let the seventh match of the Chunin exam second stage. Begin. There was something about the way the Sharingan read Kabuto's movements that immediately set off alarms in Sasuke's head. It was as if, just for a moment, the man's entire body was poised to strike. Not only that, but from what he'd been able to see, there was some serious power lurking there, untapped. And yet, a second later, the boy had reined it all back in. He'd gone from a predator about to spring into action to an unsuspecting prey. It was a good act, and against anyone else, it probably would have worked too. Not against the power of his fully matured Sharingan, however, which could read the movements of his muscles. So, what is it he's trying to do? There was the obvious answer that the boy was simply testing Sasuke's might in order to see how far he had to go against him how much he need to expend, and reveal to the rest of the gen in here, to defeat him. But there was a tiny, almost insidious voice in the back of his head that kept whispering, kept clawing at him. It feels just like Orochimaru. When he'd fought against the snake Sanin, he'd been thoroughly outclassed from minute one. And yet the warrior had made it his mission for Sasuke to never figure that out until he'd received what he wanted, until he'd finished testing him. Where Orochimaru was so good at playing with his food that even the Sharingan didn't pick up on anything, the boy in front of him wasn't quite as clean at disguising his true power from Sasuke's eyes. He shivered as he charged in, determined to finish this fight off now before whatever it was the boy wanted from him was achieved. He ducked under an initial, almost lazy blow, and formed the signs for a fireball jutsu, preparing to burn the boy away from point-blank range. Fire Style Great Fireball Jutsu Kabuto wasn't even phased, 
and Sasuke saw the boy dodge backwards in an instant, and then slow himself down manually. He allowed the flames to flicker across him, not burning him terribly, but making it seem like he couldn't dodge them completely. That eliminated the theory that he was trying to probe Sasuke's power to see how far he needed to go. Unless this was an incredibly deep bait. But even so, there would have been no reason to purposefully take a hit you didn't need to. All of this was a lie then. What the hell is it you're trying to pull? Sasuke spoke just loud enough for Kabuto to hear him, standing just a few feet to his front. I don't know what you mean, Sasuke. I'm just trying my best. The boy feigned innocence, his eyes going wide with confusion as he spoke. Don't give me that. He circled the boy, drawing a kunai into his left hand and circulating his chakra into his stomach, preparing to launch another fireball. I can read your movements with the Sharingan. You've been holding back this entire time. Why? In an instant, the posture of the boy in front of him changed. He went from being slightly hunched over to standing tall, from having himself in a terrible stance to looking battle-ready. Ah, I suppose you saw through me then. Kabuto smiled brightly, but it wasn't the same kind of smile that had sparked uneasiness in him before. I was trying to see if I needed to go all out against you, but I guess if I'm to become a chunin, I should have known I'd need to try my hardest. Fake. All of it's fake. The enthusiasm, the disarming smile, the ninja cards. All of it's fake. But does that necessarily make him the enemy? No, I can't rule out the possibility that he's simply doing all of this for himself. It was annoying, but even if the man in front of him was truly holding back to test Sasuke, just like Orochimaru had, that didn't automatically mean he worked for the Sanin. He could have just as easily had his own goals, hell, he might not have even been lying about wanting to become a Chunin. But he feels like Orochimaru. His gut told him not to underestimate the boy in front of him, and he wasn't going to start doubting his instincts now. They traded blows in the center of the arena, though with his Sharingan, it was more him landing blows while blocking Kabuto's. As he landed a particularly nasty shot directly to the boy's diaphragm, he leaned back and drew his chakra to his mouth. Fire style, great fireball jutsu. And once more, as he unleashed his flames, he noticed the boy in front of him instinctively start to dodge the attack. And then, once more, he stopped. This time, the raging fire overtook Kabuto entirely, and he was swallowed by the blast. As the fireball exploded, and heat washed over the arena, he tried to see if the boy would try and go for a counter out of the black smoke that now billowed out of the arena, it would have made for an amazing smoke screen. But once more, nothing came. Sasuke charged in once more, still trying to end the fight as soon as he possibly could, and was stopped by the proctor's hand. Kabuto Yakushi has forfeited. The winner is Sasuke Uchiha. What? He shouted perhaps just a tad too loud. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, but your last attack really took the wind from my sails. Kabuto emerged from the fireball smoke, looking largely unaffected by the fireball jutsu. He possessed no burns, and even his clothes, though ripped and torn in places, seemed mostly untarnished. If anything, he'd recovered somewhat from the earlier flames, looking to have somehow healed the damage. I was already feeling exhausted going into this stage of the exam. The boy rubbed the back of his head in a vain attempt to appear sheepish. But I thought I'll try and see if I can face off against someone super weak. But well, I ended up getting you, Sasuke, so... The boy trailed off, as if his tone alone explained everything. It probably would have, if not for the suspicion coursing through him like lightning. Well, I guess I'm done. At the very least, I'm glad I was able to dodge that last fireball. It would have sucked to take that head on. He didn't dodge. Something in Sasuke's mind spoke to him. He took the full brunt of that strike on his arms. If that's the case, though, then just how did he take no damage from my jutsu? Unfortunately, there would be no opportunity to ask the boy, as the proctor ushered him out of the arena, saying that it was time for the next competitors to fight. As he climbed to the top of the stairs, he was immediately tackled by Naruto, who was hollering like the end of the world was upon them. Yeah. All three members of Team 7 reporting for Stage 3 of the exams. The boy turned back around and began jumping once more, smiling wildly as he did. 
Damn it, kid, I told you to stay quiet. Zabuza grabbed Naruto by the collar, holding him a foot or two in the air with one hand like it was nothing. Put me down. The assassin sighed, looking over towards Sasuke lazily. Well fought, kid. The demon of the mists congratulated him simply. Why, yeah, he spoke, feeling doubt worm its way into his voice. Thanks. If Zabuza thought that his hesitation was odd, then he didn't care all that much about it, turning back to the small boy he held in right arm and, a bit hypocritically, began yelling at him to stop yelling. Sasuke's own thoughts, however, were still focused on his fight. Just what was it that Kabuto was trying to accomplish? Was he trying to accomplish anything at all? Gah, all this thinking is making my head hurt. You know, there are a lot of rude things I could say in response to that. A girl's voice echoed off to his right. But just this once, I'll give you a pass. He looked up, both surprised and excited, to see Sakura walking over towards him and the rest of Team Seven, the same woman from earlier just behind her. Yo, Sakura! Naruto called out, smiling over at her and seemingly forgetting that he was still being hoisted a few feet off the ground by Zabuza. See, the Forest of Death's proctor spoke up, smiling in an almost Naruto-like way. Told you I'd have her back by eight. Sakura looked back at her new mentor in annoyance. It's one thirty in the afternoon, Anko-sensei. I didn't say at eight, I said by eight. Anko smirked, shaking her head. Sheesh, what am I going to do with a pupil who can't even listen to her master's words? Sakura's eyes narrowed, but there was no missing the small smile present on her face. It seemed that whatever had happened between those two, it had led to them becoming fast friends. Hey, wait. Naruto yelled just a bit too loud, causing Zabuza to use his free hand to chop him across the top of his head, eliciting a small yelp from the Jinchuriki. Since everyone from Team Seven's passed into the next stage, why don't we all go for ramen? That sounds delicious, actually. No. Zabuza and Anko answered simply. What? Why? Naruto whined out. Because the next few fights will show you a lot about the genin that haven't fought yet. They've already gotten to watch your fight, so if you don't see theirs, then they enter the next stage of the exam with an incredible advantage. Anko shrugged, looking bored as she leaned against the stone wall behind her. It's not exactly super entertaining, but it is necessary. Naruto let out a whine, but quieted down, which was about as clear a sign of compliance from the boy as you could get. Oh, by the way, how'd the fights go? Who's left? Sakura asked excitedly. Um, Naruto seemed to be thinking about answering. Sasuke, you do it. Right, of course. He sighed annoyedly, but couldn't quite hide his smile. There are six competitors remaining. Tenten, Shino, Shikamaru, Zaku, Dosu, and Choji. The winners of the previous fights were myself, Naruto, those guys Gara and Kankuro from the Sand Village, Hinata, and of course you, Sakura. Lee and Niji came to a draw, so they're both out. Sakura nodded, looking a bit lost in her thoughts. I guess that means Ino lost? She spoke disappointedly. Yeah, unfortunately. Sasuke answered. She got matched up against that Gara guy, and when she used her mind switch, it didn't even seem to work on the guy. He must have the same fortitude I do. Naruto spoke up as he finally freed himself from Zabuza's grip. I've always been able to shake it off when the four of us train together. Eh, I'll ask about it later. Sakura spoke casually. Still, I was hoping to get to face her in the next stage, sucks she's out. Yeah, I'm sure Sasuke wanted to face off against Lee, too, seeing as how he almost got beat by him in the hallway. Sasuke looked over at his best friend with narrowed eyes. What was that, Naruto? I said you a hand came down on the back of Naruto's head once again, cutting him off. Oh. Both of you, shut up, Zabuza gestured to the back wall, where the screen was spinning the six remaining names around. It's time for the next fight. The room was nowhere near as quiet now as the roulette turned and Sasuke was fairly sure that was due in large part to most people having already fought. There were only six competitors remaining, out of the starting twenty, after all. When the turning finally did stop, it was to find quite the interesting match adorning the back wall. 
Zakuabumi vs. Shino Aburaim. Chapter 21 Zaka's head was fuzzy. Where am I? His right arm ached horribly, though he couldn't quite remember why. He knew that Orochimaru had broken it a day or two ago, but that pain was so much different from what he was experiencing right now. Faintly, he heard a voice say something, a voice that sounded familiar, but one that, once again, he couldn't quite place. What's going on? A voice rang so clearly through his head that it felt like it pierced straight through him. Get up. Dosu? Zakuabumi is no longer able to fight. He was at the end of a tunnel, hearing a voice from the other end as he lied down on a cold floor. He could feel nothing but pain, but the voice that spoke to him was indifferent to his plight. It sounded like he'd often imagined a god would sound completely unaffected, uncaring and merciless. He heard murmuring around him as his head lurched in pain, and he went to reach for it with his right arm, trying desperately to take hold of something, to feel something other than pain. And yet nothing happened. He looked up, trying to see anything, and found a familiar face staring down at him. Albino white skin, with purple markings around his eyes, Orochimaru looked down at him without pity, without satisfaction or glee. It was simply interest. His head rang again, another voice calling out to him, though this one was different from his teammate's cry. It was younger, sounding almost like kin, in a way. The memories that flowed through him, however, said that it wasn't hers. Zaku. The voice spoke to him simply, carving into his brain like a knife, and he opened his mouth to scream, yet nothing came out except silence. Zaku. They were being chased, he knew it, but what was chasing them? His head felt like it would split in half at any moment. Who was that other boy? A name came to the forefront of his mind. He writhed in agony as it seemed to dispel the fog that he told Orochimaru to place there. Reese. And suddenly, he was eight years old again, residing in a dump on the outskirts of the Sound Village, and living off scraps like a beast. Hey. Zaku. He ignored the boy before him, trying to drown out the shouting that came from nearby. They were getting close, he could tell. They'd be on them in a moment, and then that would be it for the both of them. You could run. His treacherous brain spoke to him, whisperings of betrayal echoing in his head. Shut up. He shouted at both his friend and his own horrid mind, gazing down at the boy below him with a fury born of pain and suffering, tears rolling down his face like a churning river. Just shut up. I'll get us out of this. Zaku. His friend spoke quietly, closing his eyes for a moment, for a horrible moment, and for just a second Zaku thought he was gone. His eyes drifted back open, and Zaka let out a relieved gasp, his hands shaking. You have to go, Zaku. The boy reached his hand out, touching it to Zaku's forearm, which even still was desperately trying to sew the boy's wounds together. Somewhere, in the back of his mind, he already knew it wouldn't be enough. Shut up, damn it! He shouted down at the boy. A second later, he heard the yelling from just beyond them go quiet, before, with a resounding cry. It suddenly grew more frantic, and to Zaka's horror, began to close in on them. He reached down under the boy's back, and beneath his knees, and tried with all of his might to lift him. Zaku, please. His friend reached up towards the sky, trying to reach up and wipe his tears away, try and erase all of this, to go back to yesterday, when it was just two kids against the entire world, and they could laugh and enjoy their lives. But there wasn't a point. The tears wouldn't stop falling. Reese looked him directly in the eye, steel in his gaze. Go. He felt his will to resist crumble as he heard the sounds around him grow even closer. His survivor instinct, the thing that had kept him alive all these years, kept Reese alive, told him there was no point to this. He had to go. He let his hands fall to his sides, pushed himself up off the jagged concrete below him, and took a step backwards. Reese. I. The boy smiled up at him, then closed his eyes, folding his hands atop his chest. Hey, Zaku? Reese spoke quietly, never opening his eyes, having truly accepted his fate. Can you promise me something? Anything. He spoke desolately, tears streaming down his face in spades. Get out of this place. 
The boy reached one hand up in the air, and to him, it must have seemed like he grasped the stars. Yet his fist fell a moment later, having never held anything at all. Get out of here and live your life how you want to. Don't let anyone else tell you how to live it. Zaka wasn't sure that'd be possible. Children like them didn't tend to get happy endings. But even still, I, I'll do my best. Reese seemed to relax at that, his body going limp, his arms sinking into the skin on his chest, just a bit more than they had before. His lips trapped in a perpetual smile. The flashback stopped suddenly, even as a few tears rolled down Zaka's cheek. Everything was so clear in the back of his head, everything he told himself to forget, he'd remembered. Did it even matter? Who cares? His mind supplied. Reese told me to live, so that's what I'll do. Thusly, the winner is. And I can't live. He felt his left hand grab hold of something, dragging his entire weight with all of his strength off of the floor. If I don't stand up. He found himself on his feet finally, having dragged himself up using the proctor's jacket. The man in question shot him a surprised look as he took a step back walking to once more stand in between the two fighters. Mr. Obumi, please. A different man than before, this one clad almost entirely in white garb, spoke worriedly. Your arm. Shut up. He had tried to shout, but found himself without the strength, his voice instead coming out as what might as well have been a whisper. I have to win. It's only the Chunin exams, if we act quickly, we can sew your arm back on, and you can heal much faster. So my arm back. He looked down, finding himself not even the least bit scared. When he saw the stump that had previously been his arm, he didn't flinch. There was no time for that. If he was going to survive, if he was going to win, then this had to be fast. Only the Chunin exams, the man had said. He wanted to laugh at the absurdity of that statement. This wasn't just a game to him, not like it was for all the rest of the students here. This was life or death. I'm not eliminated, am I? W.L., technically, you got up before the proctor could declare you unfit to continue, so. His smile became wide, almost feral, as he pushed the man out of the way, drawing a kunai from his bag with his left hand. He found his left arm in a similar amount of pain to when his right had been broken, and when he looked down, he found holes running up it, with small insects crawling out of them. Such a sight should have disgusted him, but right now, he was apathetic. He looked towards his opponent without hate, without rage, without any feeling at all. He knew only one thing as he charged the boy before him. I must win. Because if he didn't, then he wouldn't be the only one to pay the price. It would be Dosu and Kin who would pay for it as well. Did he like them as much as he had Reese? No, not quite. But that doesn't mean I can abandon them either. He'd run away from Reese, let the boy be killed by the men pursuing them. In that moment, he'd committed a sin so terrible that even he, practically a beast, had been unable to live with it. He'd asked Orochimaru to erase his greatest mistake, but even a man as powerful as the snake Stanin hadn't been able to rid him of it. And so now, with his actions, he was determined to prevent it from happening again. He was determined to claim victory here, to allow his teammates to live, just a little bit longer. Maybe they would still die. Maybe Orochimaru would use them like pawns even still, throwing them away at his soonest convenience. But maybe, just maybe, they could survive. The boy before him, the one who had, at the very start of their fight, plugged up the holes in his arms with his beetles, knew nothing of the weight Saka carried. Just as he'd said to that girl earlier, Sakura, he didn't blame the boy for that. It wasn't his fault that the world had been kind to him. And the fact that Saku was about to destroy him wasn't his fault either. The boy with the glasses blocked his first strike on his own kunai, drawing another and threatening to stab it into Zaka's chest. Instinctively, Zaka reached into his bag with his right hand and brought out his own second kunai to counter. He realized his mistake only an instant before it would have been fatal, dodging backwards as he ran through plans in his head, trying to conjure up some method of victory. Right, I don't have a right arm at the moment. Zaka backpedaled, coming to a stop a ways away. Okay, so what can I do? 
A swarm of bugs shot out of his opponent's coat, flying right towards him as they buzzed annoyingly. His head ached at the noise, and he felt a small bit of rage course through him. As if I didn't have enough shit to deal with already. He took a step forward, taking his kunai and placing it between his teeth, clamping down on it as he reached into his bag once more, pulling out one of his emergency items. As the swarm threatened to overtake him, he threw the paper bomb directly inside it. These bugs absorb chakra. I'm taking a gamble that they can't do it to something inorganic. He practically sighed in relief as the explosion went off, scattering the remaining bugs' corpses in different directions. He wanted to take a second to rest, but he was starting to feel a bit woozy from losing blood, so he instead charged back into the smoke, throwing a kunai at his opponent's previous position. There was a small shout as the kunai connected with something, and he wanted to assume that the kunai had hit the boy, but he knew he couldn't. It wouldn't have been hard for him to pretend to be hit by it, only to be secretly waiting, unscathed, for his unsuspecting opponent to emerge back from the smoke. Assume the worst, hope for the best. He jumped as high as he could as he appeared out of the smoke, looking to his left and seeing that, as he'd hoped, his opponent now bore a fairly serious cut to his abdomen that he was nursing with his left hand. The boy brought his right hand in front of him, and more bugs billowed out of it, massing towards him. He had no way of countering it. That had been his only paper bomb, and now, he was left with only a single kunai, the one resting in his mouth. Instead of trying to dodge the bugs, Saka tried something truly insane, charging right through them. They steal chakra, right? Then that's fine. As he hit the swarm, he felt his energy dwindle rapidly, burning away like fuel added to a flame. You can have it. Take it all. But in exchange. He hit the end of the bugs as almost all of his chakra was absorbed, but he didn't stop. The boy in front of him hadn't been expecting him to emerge from his makeshift wall, and he hadn't been expecting the kunai that now lodged in his shoulder either. I'll take your damn king. He drew the kunai out and held it directly over the boy's throat, threatening to kill him right there. Give, was all he said. The boy below him gave a quiet chuckle, before, with a small buzzing noise, the clone dissipated into beetles. To his left, a faint buzzing was quickly growing louder. Shit! He was knocked to the side by a massive swarm of the things, and they swirled around him in spades as he writhed on the floor the last of his chakra being steadily absorbed. Surrender. The voice of his opponent called out from somewhere beyond the cloud of insects. Or the beetles will take the remainder of your chakra, and you will perish. Surrender. Yeah, that sounds good. Zaka thought, feeling the last of his energy leave him as he fell to the floor. I guess. I'll lose here. Maybe Dosu and Kin can. His eyes shot open. Dosu. Kin. Damn it. I can't lose. His consciousness was fading, his chakra completely spent, and his bag completely empty of any more tricks. I can't lose. His right arm, or what was left of it, seemed to hum with energy. The metal tube that stuck out of it shook, even as more bugs crawled into it. I can't lose. He reached as deep into himself as he could, to the very core of his chakra and found a small, almost non-existent pool of chakra. He tapped into it, readying himself for one final attack. He forced it into his right stub and pointed it into the ground. I can't lose. To this goddamned kid. There was an explosion of chakra, stone, and beetles as the arena below him was blasted away. What was left of his arm erupted in pain, but he knew he couldn't stop, couldn't slow down. How can you still stand? The boy across from him seemed confused, not even reacting to his opponent. How? He forced himself up as fast as he could, running full speed at his opponent, who seemed to recover from his shock just a moment too late. Because my life depends on it. He rammed into the boy, using his head as a makeshift battering ram as he brought his fist into the boy's stomach, causing the bug user to cough violently. A second later, he tried to respond a few bugs swarming out of his left sleeve, but Zaka was faster, sweeping the boy's legs out from under him and tackling him to the floor. Yield. He screamed as he headbutted the boy, 
causing the back of his head to impact against the stone beneath him. The boy clicked his tongue, allowing bugs to flow out of his sleeves and prepare to surround them both. He headbutted the boy again, but the pain he received in return was nothing to slouch at. He brought his fist up and hit the boy's face, cracking his glasses as he connected. Even as he felt the beetles begin to crawl on his back, he knew he couldn't stop. He zoned out as he felt the skin on his knuckles begin to peel off, slamming over and over again into his opponent's face. His chakra felt like it could give out at any time, and him along with it, but he kept going. He fought like a cornered beast, striking with no regard for the boy beneath him. As he brought his fist up one final time, preparing to finish his opponent off, he felt someone grab his arm. He turned around with a shocked expression to see a female Jonin he didn't know. That's enough. The woman spoke. Concern, and a fair helping of rage, evident on her face. Shino Abiraim concedes. Let him say that himself. Zaku roared at her, looking back down at his opponent as he did, trying to break his arm free of her grasp, but finding his breath get caught in his throat as he did. The boy below him was breathing heavily, blood streaming from his obviously broken nose as he did. His cracked glasses lay beside him though a few shards of glass were embedded into his face. You win. The woman spoke distastefully. Now get off of my student. She lifted him by his arm and pushed him away, towards the medic who still sat by the side of the arena. Having been so lost in the fight, he'd forgotten that the man had initially tried to stop him, tried to get him to rest on the stretcher he'd brought out. He felt the pain in his arm return as the adrenaline began to wear off and he nearly fell backwards from the dizziness. After all of that, am I really going to die of blood loss of all things? He did fall a second later, though he was held up by the doctor behind him, who led him onto a stretcher, and then proceeded to place his blown-off arm on top of him. Zaku couldn't help but feel a bit queasy about that, which was an odd change of pace from how he'd felt about everything a few minutes ago. He chalked that one up to the heat of the moment as well. As he was slowly pulled out of the arena, he couldn't help but let his gaze wander. He looked up at Dosu, who nodded solemnly at him. Zaku tried to return it but found that his head wouldn't move. A second later, his eyes connected with Orochimaru's, who stood just a few feet back from his teammate. The man smiled down at him, his lips spread with a cruel glee. In that moment, he recalled Reese's words. Get out of here and live your life how you want to. Don't let anyone else tell you how to live it. Here he was, living according to someone else's rules, doing someone else's bidding. No wonder he'd chosen to forget his time with Reese. He'd not only abandoned his only friend, but then he'd gone and disgraced his last promise to the boy. I've got to do something. Saka thought aimlessly to himself. I can't just serve Orochimaru for the rest of my life. But what choice do I have? As he thought about that, he looked back towards the boy he'd fought against, who was being taken away to a medical bay on the opposite side of the arena. The boy's teammates, the Hyuga, the Inazuka, and their sensei, who he now recalled was a genjutsu specialist, all flocked around him, watching him carefully as they all walked with him. Seeing that, he felt a tiny pain in his chest, like a pinprick. A small twinge of pity, along with a growing regret. Sakura was stunned as the two boys were carried out of the arena, both of them terribly wounded. She'd been a part of a lot of battles to the death recently, but that one had to have taken the cake. Neither boy had been willing to give up, until their very lives were on the line. How? She recalled the sound ninja's screams. Because my life depends on it. Zaku's words echoed in her head for quite a while even as the next round was delayed so that the arena could be brought back into presentable shape. As it stood currently, it was covered in holes from where paper bombs and Zaka's wind had blown through it, and there were a couple thousand dead bugs lying around it as well, along with copious amounts of blood. So, his very life was at stake, huh? Sakura thought glumly, kicking herself as she did. I'd bet Orochimaru's got something on him. That has to be why. Hey, um... Sakura? She snapped to attention almost immediately, meeting Sasuke's gaze as he gave a small wave. Oh, she struggled to think of what to say, but ultimately defaulted to a general question. What's up? Nothing. The Uchiha admitted, 
rubbing the back of his neck as he did, and then taking the spot next to her on the railing, looking down into the arena. I just noticed that you looked a bit out of it. Am I that obvious? No, well, not entirely. We've just known each other a long time, and... Yeah, yeah, I get it. Sakura sighed as she leaned further forward, putting her entire weight on the metal bars in front of her and sighing as she sunk into them. I just... That fight was horrible to watch. First Sakura's arm got blown off, and then those bugs were crawling everywhere, and then Shino nearly got beat to death. I guess it just shook me a little. Yeah, Sasuke sighed. I think it shook all of us. Hell, even Naruto's looking a bit depressed. The boy pointed off to his right, where, just as he'd said, a melancholic Naruto quietly against the back wall, gazing off into nothing. It's not just you. Sasuke gave her a small smile, before walking back over towards Naruto and sitting down next to the boy, beginning to banter with him about something or another, before the Jinchuriki yelled out that he wasn't feeling down at all. Sakura laughed at the exchange but couldn't quite help but zone back out the moment a distraction was gone. Luckily, she didn't have to wait that long for a new one, as a hand on her shoulder brought her back out of her thoughts again, though this time it was her new mentor. Yo. The woman brought her hand up in greeting, sliding in next to her and hitting her lightly with her behind, knocking her to the side slightly. That was a rough fight, especially for the Chunin exams. Most of these kids are too scared to even threaten another person's life with a kunai to end a match, let alone beat each other to death. Yeah, I know I. I think if my opponent had called my bluff before, I wouldn't have been able to kill him, Sakura admitted as her right hand shook slightly. I'm glad he surrendered when he did. If he hadn't, I'm honestly not sure what I would have done. So you're not the killing type then? A small shiver ran down Sakura's spine at her mentor's words. Gods, no. I'm... Honestly, at times, I think I'm a little too soft for all of this. Sakura rubbed the back of her neck absentmindedly, leaning into the woman beside her without meaning to. I don't really like hurting people. So why? Why what? Anko asked curiously. And nothing, sorry. Sakura lied, laughing embarrassedly. Just thinking out loud. Her mentor sighed. You're wondering why you nearly killed that girl in the forest, right? The clairvoyant guest had her reeling, her hands shaking as she grabbed the bar in front of her for support, though she needn't have bothered, for Anko had already held her beneath her arms, helping to keep her steady. See, could you not be weirdly psychic for like five minutes? Anko smiled at her, ruffling her hand with her left hand as she brought it out from under Sakura before putting it in the pocket of her trench coat. No can do. Being weirdly psychic is one of the few advantages we adults have over you kids. Enko gave her a wide smile, before it tapered off, being replaced by a somewhat sad expression. Do you want to talk about how you're feeling? Not really. Sakura admitted a bit pathetically. And maybe later, it's just. Enko ruffled her hair for a second time, leaving her bangs to hang directly over her eyes. I said if you want, don't feel pressured to or anything. I'm just saying that sometimes it's better to make your feelings known, instead of bottling them all up inside you. She considered the woman's words as her mentor walked away, moving to speak with the leader of their team and his protege, who had returned from hitting on Eno around the same time she had. Well, it would have been hitting on her, except for the fact that he still claimed he didn't have a crush on her at all, and somehow actually seemed to believe that and thus he wasn't very direct about it. Luckily for him, Eno seemed to see right through him, and so she'd taken his kind words in stride, flirting back and forth with him, even if she had no intentions of getting together with the boy. Sakura could never really decide whether that trait of hers was a kindness or not. Still, it was refreshing to see Haku as a blushing mess of a teenage boy instead of the cold, almost emotionless killer he'd been when they'd first met. The screen on the back wall began to spin, but by this point, nearly everyone in the room had already fought. No matter the result of the roulette, the following match was already confirmed, so no one really seemed to care as the spinning came to a stop. Tenten vs. Shikamaru Nara Tenten did her best to keep her breathing as calm as she could as she stepped off of the metal stairs and onto the cold stone floor below her. Lee and Niji were both still in the infirmary 
so it had been Guy alone to send her off for her match. If she were being honest, the man's enthusiasm had been enough to motivate her on its own, but she still would have preferred having the whole gang to see her off. As she faced down her opponent in the center of the ring, she couldn't quite shake the feeling that he didn't want to be there. I will briefly recount the rules of this bout. The proctor began, before, as usual, everyone in the arena zoned him out. Tenten was on edge about the boy before her. From what she knew of the Nara family, which wasn't all that much, they manipulated shadows as a form of attack, defense, and utility. They could use them as blades, shields, and even as tethers or ropes. However, she'd also heard that most of those techniques were of a higher level than what a genin could accomplish, so she figured she wouldn't be seeing any of them in this particular encounter. Still, doesn't hurt to be cautious. As the proctor finished, and inquired as to whether they were both ready to fight, Tenten studied her opponent. On the surface, he was a bumbling mess. His guard was down, his eyes were glazed over, and he seemed to yawn at least five times a minute. Still, the likelihood that it was all an act was high. No one gets to this stage of the exam just to treat it as a joke. Tenten reasoned, taking a battle stance as she confirmed her readiness, drawing her staff across her arm and pointing it in her opponent's direction. I'll keep a secret weapon on me, just in case. If he's going to use shadows, then I'll use light. Then, let the ninth round of the Chunin exam's second stage. Begin. The boy in front of her tense suddenly, going from lax to prepared in half a second. It would have been an impressive maneuver if she hadn't been expecting it. He brought his hands up in front of her in a hand sign that was unfamiliar to her, but not one that she couldn't guess the meaning of. So that's the sign to bend shadows? She charged forwards, preparing her trump card in her left palm as she did, drawing a few shuriken by slotting her fingers inside them and hurling them at her opponent, forcing him to bob and weave, not allowing him to sit still and focus. Even still, she ran out of the small arms eventually, and the boy continued to backpedal, jumping backwards every time she gained ground, and throwing out his own kunai as he did. Even still, I can deflect these with ease, so why? One of the kunai began to glow, and she had half a second to realize her mistake before she was blown backwards by the paper bomb, landing hard on the cold stone beneath her. A second later, she felt an unfamiliar feeling run up her entire body, like something was grabbing her everywhere all at once. All right, well, that wasn't so bad. A voice came from out of the smoke, and a second later, so too did her opponent. He wore no smirk, nor any other sign that he thought he was victorious. He moved slowly and with a seemingly large amount of effort, drawing his left hand over to his leg and retrieving a kunai that rested there. At the same time, Tenten found herself suddenly standing and beginning to mimic the motions as the boy did them, reaching for nothing on her left leg, gripping nothing, and bringing nothing up in front of her. I don't suppose you'll surrender now, will you? The boy named Shikamaru gave a dim smile, tilting his head slightly. It'd save both of us the trouble. She gave only a glare in response, to which the boy in front of her simple laughed, taking small, careful steps towards her. I need to test something first. With her right hand, the one held before her against her will, she tried to flex her fingers, just a small bit. They moved, but only just. That's fine, it's enough. I just need to get closer. Another step. They were perhaps ten feet apart. Just a bit closer. The boy in front of her took another step, raising his weapon and gesturing like he would throw it. Just a bit. He took one final step. Closer. She opened her left hand as hard as she could, which resulted in only a small gap being formed. Luckily, that was all she needed. A flash bomb. As the small object hit the ground, Tenton's world knew only light for a small moment, but that was fine. She still knew where the boy was. As she brought her staff forward and slammed it into the boy's position, she felt a solid connection on the other end. She followed through with another two strikes, and then another. Until, all of a sudden, control of her body was wrested away from her once again. W what? She shouted, finding her vision still swirling, but finally managing to regain some small focus. Below her was a small pool of black shadow. Hey, her opponent laughed stretching, 
and gently massaging the large red welt growing on the side of his face. Did you really think I wouldn't have an answer to my most obvious counter? As the spots in her vision finally cleared, she saw that the field emanating from her opponent, a decently sized black circle with him at the center, stretched around five feet in diameter. Well, you were almost right, at least. The boy continued, raising his hands in the air, and thusly, hers. I came up with this little technique a few weeks ago. You see, even when a flash bomb is set off, a shadow is still created. The problem in using it correctly is that, generally, I can't actually see what's going on when that happens. The boy raised his hands in a what-can-you-do gesture, as did she. Still, I figured that if I could create a circle, then, at the very least, I can capture anything near me without needing to see. At this, the boy once more drew his hand across his cheek, Ten-Ten doing the same to her own. Still, without my eyesight or hearing, the only way to confirm you're near me is to take a few hits. She couldn't quite control her temper. She'd had him. She should have had him, at the very least, and yet here he was telling her that all of this was in some master plan? And to think she'd asked Guy Sensei for a flash bomb after finding out her matchup, thinking herself so overly clever too. She'd gotten the idea from the Forest of Death, when her and Team Seven had escaped from the snake Sanin Orochimaru using one of their own. And it had all amounted to nothing. I completely. Anyways, I surrender. One? What? The entire arena seemed to shout at once. Wait, what? Tenten asked herself, completely confused. But why? The boy gave a small chuckle, before, a second later, the shadows around him receded, and the boy fell backwards, sitting calmly and sighing exhaustedly. Despite what I think is a good idea behind it, I couldn't put that jutsu into practice because it drains me way too fast. Shikamaru spoke, managing to get to his feet a second later, smiling tiredly. I can only keep it up for maybe thirty seconds, and that's at full reserves. But I'd already drained myself quite a bit in the forest, and then again with the first shadow imitation. That flash bomb was a pretty good idea. I'm guessing you knew a little bit about the Nara clan? Why, yeah. She spoke after a second, still a little shocked by the last minute's turn of events. I'd heard about them every once in a while when I read up on famous leaf ninjas. Your dad's pretty famous. Hey, yeah, my old man's got a bit of a reputation. Shikamura laughed quietly, though it was more of a sharp exhale than anything. All right, well, good fight. As Shikamura began to climb the steps back to his team, the proctor, who up until then had seemed a bit stunned, called the match. If that's the case, then the winner if Tenten. Ten. The man walked over to her, asked her a few questions about the exam, and then sent her on her way. As she walked back up the stairs, she couldn't help but hear Naruto cheering her on, and smiled just a bit as she made it to the top, shooting the boy a thumbs up from across the room, which he returned with a sunny smile of his own. She spoke briefly to Guy about the victory, him congratulating her strategy, and even if she knew she should have been proud of herself for coming up with the idea, she couldn't help but feel just the smallest bit disappointed. She'd been declared the victor and yet, she didn't feel like she'd won that match. Not at all. As Zaku awoke, the first thing he felt was horrendous amounts of pain coursing through his body. The second thing he felt was that his right arm was once again attached to his body which was a noted improvement from it being a few feet away from him on the floor. He opened his eyes, finding them a bit glazed over. From what he could see, he was in a small medical bay. It wasn't much, a few pieces of equipment to monitor his vitals were sat beside him, along with a small piece of bread, and with a glass of water. The latter went much appreciated. He'd only been asleep, from what he could tell, for a couple of hours, and yet even still his throat was killing him. He reached for the cup with his right arm and found that it responded decently well. It wasn't perfect, there was a sensation similar to when his arm fell asleep present in the tips of his fingers, but it would do well enough for the time being. He drank the entire cup in two gulps, taking a couple deep breaths afterwards. He wolfed down the small piece of bread as well, sitting back against the headboard behind him and sighing deeply as he finished, feeling the food move through him and energize him. Oh, you're awake. The voice startled him, and he reached for a non-existent kunai even as he turned towards it. A second later he stopped, 
breathing a silent sigh of relief as he did. Kin, you're all right? He didn't let his feelings show on his face, choosing instead to regard her with a look of neutrality, but he felt a quiet happiness below the surface. Yeah, I sort of drifted in and out of consciousness for the first day, but since then I've been recovering. The girl gave him a tired smile. And then a few hours ago you got wheeled in here, covered in blood, completely passed out, and missing an arm. Honestly, way to boost my stress levels just as I was calming down. Yeah. Zaku rubbed the back of his neck, feeling a bit embarrassed despite himself. Sorry about that. Don't worry about it. The girl laughed quietly, leaning back into her pillows and pulling the small hospital blanket back over her. Honestly, I've only been awake this long to give you Dosa's message. What did he say? Just I won. That's it. Zaku let out a breath he hadn't known he'd been holding, smiling despite everything that had happened that day. They'd survived. Maybe just for one more day, but they'd done it. Do you know who he ended up fighting? Zaku asked, a small bit curious. Apparently the Cho from the Inoshikacho. Ken explained. Well, it was one of their kids, but from what Dosa said, he was a pretty easy opponent. That's, that's good. What, were you worried? He looked over at her and saw a faint smirk on her face, one which he couldn't quite make sense of. It hit him a second later. She doesn't know. She hadn't been present when Orochimaru gave them their ultimatum. She'd passed out just before it, when he'd stitched up her wounds as best as he could. She still thought that this was just another mission. Even if, perhaps, she had a bad feeling somewhere in the back of her head, she didn't know their lives were on the line. Do I tell her? There was something to be said for blissful ignorance. If she really could believe that everything was going to be fine up until the very final hour, then she might be in much better spirits. She wouldn't have to deal with the crippling knowledge that he and Dosa possessed. That they were meaningless. But that didn't matter. Even if it had its merits, the cons were far too many. Not the least of which was that, if something did happen to the two of them, she'd have no way of knowing until it was too late. And he wasn't going to have another life on his conscience, even if he wouldn't be around to know about it. Hey, Kin? He began, sitting up in his bed and turning towards the girl, letting his legs dangle off the side of the bed. What's up? The girl responded, turning on her side to face him, face perplexed. There's just... something I have to tell you. Naruto, much like the other nine victors of the Chunin exam second round, stood with bated breath as the Hokage made a grand speech about their accomplishments. If he was being honest, he kind of just wanted to go home already. The stress of the Forest of Death, Sakura's curse mark, Sasuke and him nearly dying a few times, and then their own fights in the second exam were finally starting to weigh on him. All Naruto wanted to do now was go back to the Leaf Village, find a Chiraku and down a couple thousand bowls of ramen, before going to bed approximately three seconds later. Come on, old man, I'm exhausted. Naruto pouted as the kage went on and on about the honor and prestige of the competition. Lord Third, seemingly reading the atmosphere of the room, sighed, and handed things over to the exam's proctor. Thank you, Lord Hokage. The man coughed into his fist, before gesturing to a small blackboard behind him, onto which he placed a piece of paper. Naruto jittered with excitement. On that page was, what he assumed, his matchup for the third round. It'd be the opponent he'd set his sights on for the near future. The Chunin exam's third stage will take place a month from today. These will be the first opponents you will go up against on that day. But do bear in mind that if you hope to win the entire competition, you will likely need to face off against two or three more opponents. The proctor finished, coughing again into his hand. Now, if you will all come up one at a time. The man's words went ignored, and instead, a crowd of excited teenagers all tried to read the same leaflet at once, hoping to catch a glimpse past the others to see who they'd be facing. Naruto Uzumaki vs. Ga! I can't see my opponent! Naruto yelled out, before being elbowed in the face by the puppet user from the Sand Village. Hey, watch it! Out of the way, kid! Why don't you make me? Naruto, stop picking fights in line. He started it, Sakura. 
I don't care if he started it. As he was once more buffeted backwards, he felt a small tug on the sleeve of his jacket and turned around to see Hinata standing before him, looking down at the floor, seeming incredibly dejected. Um, Naruto? There was something about the girl's voice that always managed to calm him down. It wasn't that he was more comfortable around her than his friends, but it was more like he could never imagine the girl raising her voice. She sounded like a cool autumn evening. What's up, Hinata? The girl met his eyes for a fraction of a second before once more challenging the floor to a staring competition. She balled her hands into fists, seemingly working up the determination to say or do something. I, I look at forward to facing you. She bowed deeply as she said it, before, with a small meep, as if she'd only just realized what she said, she turned and fled back to her sensei, who stood a ways away, smiling fondly at the two of them. Forward to facing me? Naruto questioned mentally. What's that supposed to? Oh. He turned back towards the sheet of paper on the blackboard. By now, everyone had seen their first opponent, and so they'd all moved away from it, walking back towards their teams, or, in Sasuke and Sakura's cases, waiting for him to join them. He walked to stand in front of the sheet, read off the matchups for the next stage, and had his suspicions confirmed. Naruto Uzumaki vs. Hinata Hyuga Zaku Abumi vs. Tenten Sasuke Uchiha vs. Kankuro Sakura Haruno vs. Gara, Winner vs. Dose Kinyuda Chapter 22 And so, there we were. Naruto held his hands out in front of him, setting the scene as dramatically as he could. Trapped in the forest of death, facing off against an opponent four times our size. He was of average height. Sasuke corrected from the seat on his right, swirling his chopsticks through his tongue of broth before lifting the captured noodles up to his mouth, sucking them in in but a moment. Yes, but his aura made him seem ten feet tall. That's only twice your height. Anyways, it was only me, Tenten, and Sasuke. Tenten, Sasuke, and I, Naruto. Sakura interrupted from beside Sasuke, a coy smile on her face. Naruto shot the both of them an annoyed stare, before continuing. Sasuke was carrying the unconscious Sakura along on his back, making the both of them effectively useless. They both coughed loudly, but otherwise said nothing, which, in Naruto's eyes, was effectively conceding the point. Still, with some genius planning, I managed to shake the man off of our tail using a state-of-the-art ninja tool. After that, the man continued to pursue us, constantly nipping at our heels. Through my sheer genius, I was able to once again come up with a plan. Naruto walked his audience through it, talking about the shadow clones he'd sent out and how he had, basically, stopped the Sanin all on his own. Wow, Haku smiled calmly over at him from his left, sipping some broth from his bowl as he did. To think you all fought against Orochimaru and lived. That's really quite impressive. Fought against? Ha! Zabuza shot him a look from across the bar, off to Haku's left. If that man were serious, the three of you wouldn't be here right now. He wasn't after your lives, was he? W well no, but... There, see? The man pointed his chopsticks in Naruto's direction. He had some other motive for targeting you. From what Gurley says, it's that he wanted to place a curse mark on the Uchiha. Even then, the fact that he didn't just do it immediately when he saw you three shows me that he was after something else as well. Zabuza yawned as he leaned back, stretching his arms as he did. If you asked me, he was probably testing you. Well, yeah. Naruto let out disappointedly. We kind of figured that out. Then don't go shouting about how you're all grand warriors, when in reality, you got bailed out by that damned sage. Wait, Naruto uttered confusedly. Sage? The man seemed to realize his mistake, because a second later, he coughed loudly, and suddenly shouted oi, old timer, another bull. Coming right up, came Tuchi's voice from the back of Ichiraku. Hey, Sabuza sensei you're avoiding the question. No idea what you're talking about, kid. The man spoke up a second later, giving a rough grunt that could have been construed as thanks to I am who rolled her eyes, but accepted it anyways as she walked off. Well, I think you did fantastically, Naruto. 
Irika spoke from Zabuz's left side, smiling at him in an almost motherly way. I got to catch your match at the arena the other day. Your trick with the transformation jutsu was phenomenally well set up. Naruto blushed as he drank the last of his broth, about to raise his voice to ask for another before Ayam placed a fourth bowl in front of him, smiling down on him with a look that said yeah, we already know. Still, Iruka continued, barely missing a beat. It's a real shame that your first opponent is little Hanada. And there goes my good mood, Naruto thought glumly. Ah, Iruka sensei Sakura sounded annoyed as she slapped their teacher lightly on the arm. You weren't supposed to say the H-word. Their teacher laughed a bit, but it seemed the somber atmosphere Naruto let off was spreading, because the conversation around the entire table was gradually growing quieter, until there was no one speaking at all. Even the two ramen chefs in the back had gone back to cleaning their instruments, wanting to listen in on what Naruto had to say. With anyone else, he might not have been willing to keep speaking. But Tuchi and Ayam might as well have been family, so he swallowed his doubt and spoke freely. Honestly, I'm sure anyone else would be thrilled to be matched up against Tanada. She's not all that powerful, and she doesn't have any real points of strength, other than the Hyuga style, which even then she uses at a very mediocre level. Naruto knew that his words were being a bit brutal towards the girl, but felt that revealing his feelings was crucially important. But she's already dealt with a lot in her life, even I can tell that. I, I don't want to have to hurt her pride any more than it's already been. You're that confident you'll win? Zabuza spoke, before snorting a second later. What am I saying? The only reason you're saying this is because you're so sure. Hinata's not terrible. Sasuke spoke up, leaning back in his chair and letting his hands fall back behind him. Problem is, Naruto just does everything she does better. Close quarters combat? Naruto's better. Dodging and reacting? Naruto's better. Chakra reserves? Naruto's better. Planning? Well, you get the idea. She doesn't have any means to attack him with. You're not planning on throwing the match, are you? Haku asked, looking slightly appalled. Of course, he's not. Sakura spoke up, as if it was completely obvious as if that wouldn't destroy her pride in its own way. As sorry, I just... No, Sakura sighed, running her hand through her hair. I'm sorry, it's my fault. You were just worried as well. I think I'm a little on edge about my own fight as well. Is it because of what Ino told you? Sasuke asked, looking over at Sakura. Ino-san? Haku's head turned so fast that it audibly cracked, making the entire table wince as the boy massaged it. W what's she up to? Great save, brat. Zabuza sighed, rubbing his temples as he did. Great save. Yeah, I went to console her yesterday at the flower shop, and Ino told me about her fight with Gara. After a second, Sakura clarified. Gara is the boy I'm facing in my third exam fight. Oh, Haku nodded. Okay. Is he strong? Iruka spoke up, taking a sip of his water as he did. I don't know. According to teammate, he killed a few people in the forest, but even then, I don't have any more information than that. Ino surrendered immediately when she fought him, apparently because, when she entered into his mind, she found a giant monster inside of him. It felt like Naruto's stomach, directly above his seal, had a bucket of ice poured onto it. He gasped loudly, drawing everyone's attention towards him. Naruto? Sasuke looked towards him worriedly. You all right? The feeling hadn't subsided, but it had dissipated somewhat, allowing Naruto to simply grin and bear it, pretending to be completely fine. Yeah, I'm good. He lied out of his teeth, looking back towards Sakura to divert the attention away from himself. What were you saying? Right. The girl eyed him suspiciously, but eventually continued. According to her, it was a giant creature made out of, well, she said it was a giant sand raccoon but that sounds a bit ridiculous. It's not. A voice murmured from within his seal. It's not. He spoke without meaning to. Once more, everyone turned towards him, giving him an odd look. I'm not sure what it means, but the moment you said that, I got this weird feeling coming from my seal. Naruto tried to articulate his thoughts, 
though it didn't seem to be working all that well. I guess maybe the Ninetales knows something? That's an awfully harsh assumption. Zabuza laughed harshly as he turned towards him, gesturing towards Naruto's four finished bowls of ramen. You sure you didn't just get a super coincidental stomachache? He nodded, completely serious, and for once his feelings seemed to reach the man across from him, for Zabuza's eyes widened momentarily, before he suddenly sat straighter, taller. Then in that case, let's take this conversation elsewhere. He tilted his head towards the ramen chefs, who, even if they were trying to make themselves scarce, were at most four or five feet away from them. We can go find that girl Ino and Naruto can ask her about it directly. The man sighed. Gods know Haku will like it. They all nodded, Irika paying for all of their meals as they headed out, much to the man's distaste. Aren't you a working adult ninja? The teacher chided, pointing his finger into the face of one of the world's most dangerous jonin. You can't even pay for your kid's meal? Haku ain't my kid. Zabuza corrected harshly, getting in the teacher's face. And you said you were treating, did you not? Despite what one might have expected, Irika didn't back down, instead leaning into the man, despite being an inch or two shorter. I told Naruto and his team that I would treat them. Well, unfortunately for you, I've been drafted into Naruto's team. That means you're paying for all of us. And that boy? Iruka pointed at Haku, who seemed to look back and forth between the two, completely confused as to what was going on. Um, I can pay for the meal, sir. The ice user spoke awkwardly. No, I treated you. But you just said. I said that this man Iruka pointed at Sabuza, his finger perhaps an inch from the man's face. Should have paid for you. I did not, however, mean to imply that you should pay for yourself. This is confusing. Naruto spoke quietly. Agreed. The other members of Team 7 echoed. After a few minutes, and more than a few more attempts from Haku to simply pay for his and Zabuza's share of the meal, all of which went unaccepted, the demon of the mist let out the heftiest sign Naruto had ever heard, and shoved a few hundred yen into Irika's waiting hands. And so the saga of Irika sensei getting the world's most famous assassin to pay for his own ramen comes to a close. Naruto bowed towards the two, as did Sakura and Sasuke. Truly, we have witnessed the end of an era. Can it you three? Hello? Welcome to the Yamanaka. Oh, hey Sakura. Hey Ino. Sakura called out as she waved back to her friend, stepping inside of the small flower shop flanked on both sides by Naruto and Sasuke, and followed shortly by Zabuza and Haku, Iruka having gone home for the night. What you all doing? The girl asked as she vaulted the counter, taking a few steps over towards them before stopping in her tracks, an almost malicious smile spreading across her face as she linked her hands behind her back. Oh, how are you today, Haku? The boy in question went about as red as one could, sputtering out something that very well may have been a greeting but for all intents and purposes came out as a series of choked gasps. Ino giggled, which in turn made Haku's face somehow redder, but a second later, Zabuza stepped in front of him, both shielding his brat from further embarrassment, and allowing them to finally get to the topic at hand. After hearing what they had to say about Naruto's own experience, Ino seemed perplexed. I'll be honest with you, I've already told Sakura all there was to tell. Ino rubbed her chin with one hand trying to come up with anything that she could to help them out. I encountered a monster in the boy's head. I screamed and exited immediately. He attacked me afterwards, but I don't think it was related to that monster at all. She paused for a second. Yeah, that's about it, unfortunately. Humph, Zabuza muttered from the back wall. Not a lot to go off of, is it? He turned back towards Naruto, eyeing the boy curiously. Well, kid? Get anything out of that? He tried to search his mind, ran his hand over his seal, but in the end, nothing came of it. There was no sudden flash of information as he'd been hoping, and instead he was met only with silence. No, I didn't. He admitted with a disappointed sigh, looking back up towards everyone with an apologetic smile. Sorry guys, looks like I wasted your time. His friends all laughed at that, which had him a bit confused. Honestly, we're not wasting our time, you dummy. Sakura smiled at him, wrapping her arm around his shoulder. 
I'm just happy to see Eno, and I'm sure Haku could say the same. The boy let out a quiet meep, before once again disappearing behind his master. I'm sure one day he'll be honest with himself. Sakura whispered to him in a not-so-subtle way. He felt his mood lift significantly, an easy smile once more settling back on his face. I wouldn't count on it if I were you, he whispered back. Besides, Sasuke spoke as he walked over to the two of them, looking down at Naruto with a fake annoyed expression. You've been looking way too cool lately. If you didn't mess up every once in a while, then I'm fairly sure the world would cease to be. The entire gang laughed at that sans Zabuza, who was still trying to deal with Haku cowering behind him. You've faced down B and A-ranked ninjas Haku, and a little girl is the first thing to scare you. I don't know what you're talking about. Ino herself laughed, muffling it into the side of her hand as she looked over to the three of them. So, since you're all here, how about helping me wrap some of the bouquets for tomorrow's sales? Ino leaned into them, wrapping her hands together. Pretty please, you guys? Sakura groaned loudly, but otherwise relented, walking behind the counter and grabbing some wrapping paper, muttering all the while about how she shouldn't have come here in the first place, even if Ino was hanging off of her and laughing the entire time. Sasuke and Naruto themselves did the same, lightly chiding one another on their skills, or lack thereof, regarding flower wrapping. They'd done it many times in the past, Ino was never one to skimp on making her friends help her out and yet they never seemed to get any better at it. As they neared the end of the night, however, it seemed they would finally learn new information. Oh! Eno shouted suddenly, turning towards the three of them with an excited smile adorning her features. I just remembered something else. That thing spoke to me. Really? Naruto turned towards her, thrilled to receive anything at all. What did it say? The girl thought for a moment, before looking rather annoyed. Aff. Eno ran her hands through her hair, gaze directed at the floor. I can't remember the words exactly, I'm sorry. That's fine, honest. Naruto tried to comfort her, even as Sakura and Sasuke crowded around them. Do you remember the gist? Yeah, I do. Eno answered. It was something along the lines of, hey, who are you? That's not a lot to go off of. Naruto admitted with a mental sigh. But it was odd, the girl continued. From what I saw, his mouth didn't really move. It was more like. I heard the voice directly in my head. Just like me, Naruto realized with wide eyes. Naruto, you getting anything from that? Sakura asked, hope seeming dim for the girl. Yeah, actually. His friends looked over at him like he was crazy but the excited smile on his face must have told them something was up, for everyone in the room turned his way, looking tense, but curious. I think that whatever Singara's head is a creature a lot like the Nine Tails. Naruto concluded, looking over towards Zabuza. Hey, old man. Don't call me that. As sorry. Naruto apologized, before continuing. Anyways, have you ever encountered another monster of that nature, or or heard about one? The assassin went quiet for several seconds, evidently considering something. With a worldly sigh, he looked back up at the five of them, eyes hard. What I'm about to tell you isn't technically a secret. Knowledge of the tailed beast isn't restricted in any real way. In fact, among higher-level ninja, it might as well be common knowledge. Tailed beasts? Naruto thought curiously. I won't tell you about the legends, they honestly don't matter at all, but I can tell you that in this land reside nine-tailed beasts. I, personally, have talked to men who saw the three tails with their own eyes. So, which one of them is the one Eno saw? Sakura spoke up. Honestly, I have no idea based on the information, but we can assume based on the village it came from. Zabuza turned to Eno. Girly, you said that Gara was a member of the Sand Village, correct? Why, yeah. In that case, you've only really got one option. Zabuza spoke, sighing as he looked around at them all. Shikaku. The one tail. It was as if his seal agreed, a rumbling in his mind that sounded almost like laughter echoing throughout. No one spoke for a while as they all contemplated the news. It wasn't exactly a shock to learn the existence of more monsters for Naruto, 
given that one literally lived in his stomach, but he imagined that, for the others, it might have been a bit of a surprise. What do we do? Sasuke spoke up, looking towards Zabuza. Should we take this information to the Hokage? You all, Zabuza pointed to the five of them, aren't doing anything. I'll take the information to him, and even then, all I'm taking is a hypothesis, albeit one backed up with some pretty good evidence. Thanks, old man. Zabuza turned back towards him, opened his mouth to speak, and then simply sighed, raising his hand in goodbye as he stepped out of the flower shop, Haku on his heels. Gee, good night, Inosan. The girl giggled. Good night, Haku. Once more, the boy let out a small meep, before rounding the corner and following his master. All right, Sakura spoke up, stretching as she yawned tiredly. I think we should all follow their example. It's getting awfully late. What are you talking about? Eno spoke curiously, and just a tad maliciously, to her friend. Huh? Eno held up a few hundred pieces of wrapping paper, along with a makeshift bouquet. We've barely even started. Jiraiya sat silently atop one of the leaf's many water towers, watching the leaf's young Junchuriki make his way back home after a long evening of wrapping flowers and chatting with his friends. And he'd been forced to watch the entire thing on the off chance someone tried to attack him. Honestly, Jiraiya complained, lying back on the cool metal beneath him. Saddling me of all people with a simple protection job, how lame. At the sound of footsteps behind him, he didn't even budge. Instead, he turned casually towards them, groaning as he saw one of Danzo's umbu before him. Man, why did it have to be one of you guys? He rubbed his head, yawning as he did. You all are never any fun. Lord Danzo requests an update on your mission. The man kneeled before him. You have not once reported to him the entire time you've been in Kanoha. Jiraiya snickered, flipping off the tower and landing in front of the man, looking down at him with a lazy smile. And he didn't think that maybe, just maybe, that was a pattern. My lord has always thought of you as a powerful ninja, but one that does not take his duty seriously enough. Thusly, he asked for a confirmation of. Yeah, yeah, I get it already. Jiraiya took a small scroll out of his coat, quickly jotted down the words nothing to report, and handed it over to the man before him. There. If he wants anything more, tell him to suck it. I will not. The umbu replied simply, before disappearing off the rooftop. The toad sage sighed, looking back down one final time at his objective, who was now laying in his bed, and snoring rather loudly out of his open window. Charming! He deadpanned. Suddenly, Jiraiya heard a distinct ribbit in the distance, which meant that someone, or something, had breached his perimeter. That wasn't unexpected, people walked around the streets even in the dead of night, but this one was a different cry, made specifically for a group of very particular ninjas. His entire posture changed, going from lazy and tired to serious and alert in half a second, coasting along the rooftops at a decently high speed, moving towards where his frog had cried out. When he arrived, he saw exactly what he'd been hoping for. Heh. Jiraiya laughed confidently as he stared down at his new targets for the evening. One Zakuabumi and Dosa Kinuda. I wonder what you're up to. So, Kin's still recovering after more than a week, and yet here you are, walking along as if you didn't just have your arm blown off. Dosa shot him a look of doubt, one that Zaku couldn't help but wilt under. Yeah, well, Orochimaru didn't call her out here. He argued back, turning down an alleyway as he heard the croaking of a frog off in the distance. He asked the two of us specifically to be there. Not a lot we can do, to be honest. His right arm was still in a splint, and from what the doctors had said, it likely would be for quite some time. Humph, I guess you're right. Dosa conceded, sighing wearily as they turned towards a more barren part of the leaf village, to cramped paths and deserted streets. They finally reached their goal in the form of a worn-down shack. It seemed to have once been used for the creation of alcohol, but that had to have been years and years ago. It looked to have been long since abandoned, but that was fine. It catered to their group's needs nicely. When they walked inside, they were immediately met by two sound jonin, who greeted them with a pair of kunai, and immediately searched them. Zaku himself grumbled annoyedly, but otherwise stayed quiet. 
There was nothing to be done about Orochimaru's cautious nature. After the ninjas finished and ushered them inside, they were greeted with a small set of stairs that led downwards into the earth. After walking for half a minute, they emerged into a decently large room, perhaps twice the size of the shack they'd been in earlier. How nice of the final two to join us. The raspy voice of Orochimaru echoed within the small metal chamber, and as Zaku and Dosu somewhat nervously took their seats, the former couldn't help a small amount of shock as he spotted a familiar face. Wait. Kabuto? He uttered without meaning to. Ah, I see you've noticed then. Orochimaru's voice rang out, sounding mildly intrigued. My dearest apologies, but I felt that revealing Kabuto's nature to you before the second exam might have inhibited your ability to compete. I'm sure that's no problem at all, is it? Of course not, sir. Dosu bowed, and Zaku followed, having learned his lesson from his arm being broken a few days prior. His arm having been broken, and then blown off a few days later turned out to be an odd mix of problems, because, from what the doctors had told him, they hadn't been able to completely fix it. They'd done him the favor of sewing parts of his left arm back together as well, and thank the gods, removing the beetles from underneath his skin. He shivered just thinking about it, his bravado during the fight a thing of the past now. Even still, from what they said, it would take many months, along with continued treatments, to bring his right arm back to the point where he could fight with it. It was a shame, then, that if their plan went off without a hitch, his arm probably wouldn't be getting that treatment. Obviously, Orochimaru had doctors, but they weren't generally the best of the best. You didn't need to work for a maniac if you weren't, likewise, a little off in the head. As he contemplated this and that, Orochimaru began speaking. The invasion of Kanoha has, so far, gone as planned. Each of you has a role. Most, if not all of you, will be acting as frontline fighters. You will storm the gates, scale the walls, or summon creatures that will do it for you. Orochimaru's commanders all nodded towards him. This will be a two-pronged assault, attacking the main gate with a massive summon, while also sending half of our forces around the back, scaling the Hokage Monument, and raining fire from the back, attacking the civilian encampments and causing mass panic. A shiver ran down Zaka's spine at those words. He silently prayed that he wouldn't be assigned to the unit in charge of murdering civilians. However, there are a few people present at this table who will have more involved roles in this mission. Orochimaru first gazed towards Kabuto. You, of course, already know your role, correct, Kabuto? Of course, Lord Orochimaru. Kabuto bowed, smiling maliciously as he did. You know, Zaka thought to himself, eyes narrowed slightly. They could do to be less obviously evil. Orochimaru went down a makeshift list, telling them all about their roles and what they'd be doing. Most weren't at all complicated. Assist with either the frontal assault or the rear assault. And lastly, you too. Zaku stood ramrod straight as the man addressed he and Dosu, smiling in that way that seemed to pick at his very being. You are, obviously, being entered into the main competition. You will have a variety of jobs, from buying the plan time if we need it with your fights, to speeding the plan up by conceding early. You will, also, be reporting in from time to time on what you're able to find out about the arena. Security, attendees, fighters, that sort of thing. Yours is a role largely supportive in nature. Right. The two of them responded. Orochimaru took a while longer to finish outlining the plan, setting them all up with a variety of jobs, each unique though some sounding much less important. Zaku couldn't help but notice just how minor their role was. It felt like they could have been killed and Orochimaru would have barely been hindered at all. Perhaps that's the idea. As the meeting finally finished, Orochimaru called out to the two of them. Oh, you two, meet with me after this is over. I have a job specifically for the both of you. A small insidious core of fear bloomed inside Zaku's heart, and he realized in that moment that, if Orochimaru desired it, then they would die right here. Surrounded on all sides by enemies, he could do whatever he pleased. No point in worrying about it. A part of him that was sounding far braver than he felt spoke out. He could have killed us at any time. Why would he do it now after taking the time to explain all of that to us? The rational logic there made him feel just a bit better, 
and so it was with heart beating a million times a minute that he and Dosu walked towards the man after the meeting was over, facing him down at the back of the room as he smiled at them. Oddly enough, the Sanin was holding a small toad in his hands. Well, you two seem to be adapting rather nicely. The man put a hand over his mouth, his eyebrows racing in mock concern. Ah, uh, Zaku, how has the arm been doing? Anger filled him, but he couldn't let it show. Instead, he gritted his teeth and smiled. It's been doing much better, thank you for asking, sir. Orochimaru smiled, clearly amused at his response, and then apparently decided to get back to the topic at hand. Now, the two of you have been doing rather well lately, so I felt it was the time to approach you with this now. He reached behind him and brought out two flak jackets. As long as you finish the next mission that I'm about to assign to you, you will each be awarded the rank of Chunin in the Sound Village, and be awarded greater protections. That's... That's amazing, sir. Dosu spoke simply, bowing his head as he did. Thank you very much. Please, it is of no meaning. You two have really proven yourselves these past few days. There was something wrong there that Zaku couldn't quite catch. He couldn't tell if it was present, or if it was missing, but something was out of place. So, Lord Orochimaru. Zaku cut in, eyes narrowed in a distrusting way. What is this mission you'd be having us do? Ah, uh, good of you to ask, Zaku. It's rather simple, actually. You see... There's a certain member of our organization who hasn't been pulling their weight as much recently. I shot up Zaka's spine. I'm afraid that they haven't quite met the same level of success as the both of you have, and thusly, they've been deemed unnecessary for the plan to continue. Orochimaru's smile was one filled with such malice, such venom, that Zaka felt himself growing sick just looking at it. So, I've decided that the two of you will be cleaning up after her. Zaka's eyes were wide even as his hands shook. Go to Kintsuchi, Orochimaru declared, and dispose of her. 